I've had people ask me like, well, do you think I'm worth less mm -hmm. because I'm not a virgin yeah. or because I have a higher body count? Does that make me worth less than the next Christian girl? No Christian man will ever want me, will ever love me, will ever want to marry me. Um, I think, you know, for that girl out there, I want you to know something. <laughs> the distinction between Mormons and Christianity, on the surface, they sound like they're not that big. Like, oh, you believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. I believe in eternity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yet if you drill in, there's some real theological differences. I have two questions I just saw that are kind of good. Uh, one is, should I care about politics? What's up, guys? This is David back with Maverick and Elena. Let's go. Truth What's and up? Love Oh, I podcast. got you a gift. You got me a gift. I got you a gift, dog. No. I did. It's actually going to be the... Oh, look at this. You love it so much. Wow. Are you serious? The Barbie hat. I love it. <laughs> I... You loved mine so much last episode, I had to get you one. Dude, I did love your Barbie hat. This... My wife would actually... And you said it's your favorite you. movie. It so. is. We should take yes, a picture. It is such a classic. Um, oh my gosh! Did oh you wow, have, trucker hats, man! Did you have these made? No, those ones uh, I, I, my sister in law found. I told her to make me some for you, <laughs> David. And, uh, pink is not your color. <laughs> okay, wow. Since when is pink not my color? I've never it's seen you wear pink before. It kind of goes with your fit. I I kind of don't have um, the backwards a little bit. The backwards is better. Yeah, you're backwards, backwards guy. Yeah. There we go, guys. Should we wear them the whole episode? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to. You should. I. You should too. I'm probably gonna pass. Probably not. <laughs> all right. Um, fine. But uh, all right. What? Um. Hey. Thank you. Of um, course. I, I love it. Thank you, Matt. A lot to you. Where did you get this? I don't know where she got it. I just told her to pick me up some. Oh Aww. man, yeah. this guy, dude. He came bearing gifts. <laughs> um. Let's how's go. How's everyone doing? Doing good. Great. Doing good. Um. My birthday was yesterday. So. I mean, this is in the future, but yeah, the, it was actually <laughs> it was yesterday. actually yesterday. Um, and yeah, got to celebrate, hang out with some friends. It was awesome. Did you do anything time. fun? Um, I worked until like eight thirty ish, and then went to a dancing competition. So I had a lot of fun. And what happened at the dancing competition? I, I did win. Yes, I did. It was fun. It was it was my first Jack and Jill win at that place too. So I was excited. It was fun. So Maverick actually does dance competitions. Yeah, I saw some. I saw some dancing on your Instagram. I'm extremely impressed. Thanks. Really? I yeah. need to go watch some. Man, hey, if you have a connection with Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, we really need to get yes. Maverick Baker on. <laughs> That's the goal here. <laughs> and he deserves it. He's the best. Um, let us know if you guys have connections. I will win. Would you actually do it? I, isn't there a time commitment? My, I would assume yeah, it's like. Yeah, if my schedule allowed it and it made sense financially, yeah, I'd do it. You have to do it. It's. I love Dancing with the Stars. Is it once a week? Yeah, it's like once a week, but I'm honestly, I might go and just try to lose right away just so I could what? say I did it because so I could get back to work because I don't think I could take like, it's like a, like eight weeks. It's like eight episodes, I think, or something like that. Don't you fly in though? Yeah. I but I, I, there's no way out. I can be gone for two months. Like, yeah. No yeah. Way. Um, yeah. That is wild. Anyways, that's not what we're talking about, but congrats <laughs> yeah. on the W. Thanks. Uh, it's a Jack and Jill, which means you don't pick your partner. Yeah. Random partner, random song. And uh, what was your just song? Look at the draw. Uh, I don't even remember what song we did. We got a slower one though, so I was okay. excited because I, I do well with slower songs. Like is slow? it country or is it? Yeah, it was all country. Uh, yeah, I was at a honky tonk here in Dallas. Man, honky that's... tonks, man. Gotta love them. Gotta love them. Tonks. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. Which is win number what? Five? Four? I don't know. Yeah, right. Probably way more than that. You, that's... Mm -hmm. No, I don't. I've just started competing in the last couple months. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gosh. Uh, but. That's amazing. I'm excited. It, I got a, a Worlds coming up in January, so I'm excited for that. You have Worlds? I have Worlds coming up. And they're in up. Dallas? It is in Dallas. Do you have year. to qualify? Uh, I I know I'm qualified. I'm I'm going. I already signed up. I don't know if there's like prereqs that you have to hit. Yeah. Uh, but we, we, we got in. So. Wow. I feel like we need to take this show on the road we and do. go record some of that. <laughs> yes. Let's no. go, man. It'll um, be fun, though. I'm excited. Dude, that's Sorry. wild. All I have right. a toxic trait. I think whenever I'm watching Dancing with the Stars, I think I'm a really good dancer. And then I try to replicate the moves, and I'm like, okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Um, it's crazy. The the, the uh, culture, like the community and dance culture, though, does have a lot of uh, what we're going to get into today, which is 
hookup culture. Mm. Um, there's a lot of people that, you know, they dance to meet people. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it a pretty big community? Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, the hookup culture is. but Yeah, hookup culture is it's pretty big if you've heard of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, International. Interna yeah, all right. Hookup culture. What, what did we mean by hookup culture? Uh, just like hookup culture in the sense of, I feel like nowadays, guys, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but like, guys and girls it doesn't there's no dating there's no there's no hey can i pick you up at five can can we go out and maybe go out on a couple dates and then maybe um wait till marriage even now mm -hmm. it's just like hey i swiped right on you want to yeah. come over to my place yeah yeah netflix and chill yeah yeah hookup culture when we say that we're referring to what we would say is a really toxic element of modern day dating where people have introduced sex to your point the biblical perspective on sex, and this is not to shame anyone or make anyone feel bad or make any, you know, all of us have sexual brokenness in all of our stories, just like every person does. But mm -hmm. God's design for sex would be that it would take place in the context of marriage between one man, one woman for life. And culture, which is not Christian, has swung the pendulum totally to the other side. And now, to your point, it's like, man, we, we don't even go on a date and we're hooking up or we're Netflixing and chilling. Yeah. We've so devalued sex that you know it's just even expected for a lot of people it's expected yeah. for a lot of people yeah. and and the culture of it is like it's sex is not that big of a deal like you can mm -hmm. casually have it with people you can take emotions out of it and just like it's just a physical act and it's just sex it's not um it's not intimacy romantic. it's not romantic yeah it's just like you can remove emotions you can do that and then like never talk to the person and you should be okay you know because it's just it's not that big of a deal you yeah. know like yeah. that's the overall vibe of hookup culture too and like it's just for fun like as long as both people are consenting that's really all you need like that kind of like that's the that's the hookup culture totally yeah hey, once you're ready if they're ready mm -hmm. man it's just physical which right. is so catastrophic it's extremely unhealthy yeah and mm -hmm. it's having so much pain and so many effects i mean one of the ways you know sex is not just physical which paul says in first corinthians chapter six where he says don't you understand that every other sin a person commits is outside of their body but he who sins sexually sins against their own body when you sleep with that other person the two become one every time because in that time people were sleeping with prostitutes and he says every time that you sleep with prostitutes or every time you sleep with somebody you're fusing yourself to them and then ripping them apart from you and one way that i think is clearly evident sex is not just physical that it's not just like um you know wrestling with somebody that that, that is purely physical you know that it's internal or it's almost um it's there's a spiritual element to it or a soul level is candidly like the the survivors of abuse or rape mm -hmm. i mean people will carry that in a way yeah. that's not just like, hey, I got punched in the face in fifth grade and wow, that really hurt and I've never told anybody about this and I, I blame myself for it and um, I, you know, I can't believe that this happened and I'm damaged goods. Somebody getting a black eye, that doesn't happen. They don't carry any shame and guilt. They're just like, I got punched. Yeah. But somebody getting abused, man, they carry that often for years and years and years because something so deeply internal, almost intrinsic to them, it impacted and touched them at a soul level. So we we know it's not just physical mm -hmm. uh, or I would say culture at the same time nods or at least has an awareness that, Oh, there's something that's not just, I mean, the mm -hmm. whole move to me too movement yeah. was not just, Oh, you physically, um, you physically assaulted me or you physically harmed me. It, it, it's still wrong and bad, yeah. but it was outrage and appropriately. So a lot of it because of people using their positions of influence, power, to sexually abuse people. And the reason they were so much outraged is because it impacts such a deep level of that person. And do you remember like some of our past messages at the porch, for example, when we talked about sex glue and how like there's scientific evidence that yes. there's actually a connection between two people. Do you remember like some of those? Yeah, it's like the, the details on that. I mean, not to be too graphic, but yeah, a lot of the, the science is like every time that orgasm takes place, the synapses in your mind bond to your surroundings and they bond to the person that you're with, which is brilliant in the context of marriage. It's like, wow, God really was onto something that he created. In fact, there's even uh, endorphins that are called, oh man, I'm going to butcher what they are. But this, this is fascinating. You can go look it up. Type in love hormone in, and it basically is like an oxytocin that gets released into the body. And the average female has 
10 times the amount of oxytocin going through her body at any given point. Like just 10 women, times? 10 times. It's called the love hormone. It's why women are generally nicer. They're like sweeter, except for one exception where the surge true, though. happens yeah. <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. there's, there's some that are not. <laughs> you know who you are. Um, but uh, one time that that is not the case is during sex. And that that endorphin floods or that hormone, I'm sorry, floods the male mind and reaches that that are equal or surpass that of females, which is a bonding agent. It basically is designed to create love, feelings of warmth, connection, which is so brilliant Mm -hmm. from a perspective of God and marriage. Because it's like every time that happens, we're reuniting back together, but is so destructive outside of the context of marriage. In fact, there's been studies that have shown what what we all know to be true, which is basically the more that you have casual sex, the more that that hormone is not released as much. And so it's ba- – Like desensitizes. It desensitizes. Yeah. And wow. I think what's also interesting about that, the statistics and the science behind it, is um, we get so many comments and people asking about like in Q&As and stuff about soul ties. And how, yeah, like, yeah. So that's kind of what I think they mean by that. It's like, totally. hey, I feel this really deep connection with this person that I've crossed boundaries with and been intimate with. And I want to break that connection. It's like, yeah, that's because that's how it was designed. Like, you were not supposed to break that connection. And that's like the whole soul ties. Yeah, like, can you elaborate on what soul ties are? Culturally or like biblically? Uh, both. I, I think guess. when people say soul ties, yeah, yeah, it's that exactly what that's talking about of like this connection that. You feel with someone that feels almost unbreakable. Like you can't, no matter how hard you try to not feel the same way about that person and yeah. cut them out of your life, like you just, you keep coming back. You don't know how to stop, right? How totally, yeah. You- and now that that's the cultural one or the biblical one? That's how culture says it of like soul ties. I think yeah. that's what people refer to, right? Yeah. I don't know that that's in the Bible. <laughs> no, but what is in the Bible is indications that the, there is a soul tie that's happening in 1 Corinthians 6 where it says, and even the Hebrew word in that's used in Genesis 2 when it's talking about sex is the intermingling of, of souls. Mm-hmm. It's literally what the word means. Then in mm-hmm. sex, it's wow. not just physical. It's like at the deepest level, the two of you are being fused and bonded together. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 talking about, don't you know that when you sleep with that random person, you're fusing yourself to her and the two become one flesh. So I think that's why as Christians, we can go culture's words of like, man, soul ties. And I feel like we have the soul tie. There's some biblical truth in that yeah. because you did tie something together that God never intended to be bonded together outside of the context of marriage. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like uh, today that happens. So, so what happens when like biblically, if you're a guy or girl and you're like, okay, well, I'm a Christian, but I've lived a, a very sinful life. Maybe I had a crazy time at college or whatever. Yep. And I have a high body count or a body count of any sort. Yeah. Does that make them? I've had people ask me like, well, do you think I'm worth less mm-hmm. because I'm not a virgin yeah. or because I have a higher body count? Does that make me worth less than the next Christian girl? Yeah. No, for sure not. I mean, the value any of us has is fixed because of what Jesus did on the cross, dying. He shows us our value. You know, economics is a class you have to take in college a lot of times. And mm-hmm. kind of economics 101 is the value of a thing is determined by the price it will bring. Like I can say this iPhone is worth $10 million. Mm-hmm. And you'd go, bro, it's not worth $10 million. I go, it's worth $10 million. And how do we know if it is? If, if somebody's somebody going to pay. It. Yeah. yeah, $10 million. So then you go, well, how do I know what you're worth? No matter your story, well, it's reflective of or determined by what's the w- price someone's willing to pay, what's the price God was willing to pay, the life of his own son, the most valuable thing possible. So that is a fixed value that people have. What you can say to someone who feels like, man, I'm worth less because of what I've been doing is remind them that's <gasps> not true and remind them that the reason God commands you to not treat sex like it's worth less or that your body is worth less and to honor your body and to preserve wherever you are at right now, the best thing you can do is pursue purity and save sexuality. Even if you have a high body count, man, I'm going to commit myself to living and walking in purity. And the next person that I'm going to sleep with is going to be my spouse and to not treat myself as worth less because that's what you're really if you're like man i'm worth Mm -hmm. less so i'm just going to keep sleeping with people you're actually telling yourself and believing to yourself i'm worth less so i might as well give myself out for less 
Yeah. Got you. I think that, so yeah, if that's part of your background and that's part of your story, then it's like you you draw a line in the sand and you say, from now on, like I am only going to save intimacy in that way with my future spouse. And I think there's a lot of, let's just, even girls out there who could feel like, okay, well, what if a Christian guy like doesn't want me because that's part of my story and I'm eventually going to have to tell him that. Mm -hmm. And he might just be looking for a girl that's strictly like his credentials of what he's looking for is virgin is on the top of the list. And like, I'm like, no Christian man will ever want me, will ever love me, will ever want to marry me. Um, I think, you know, for that girl out there, I want you to know something. <laughs> if a man is, to him. It truly believes the Bible and the gospel and the fact that he has sinned much and he was forgiven and he needs to, for, like, if he if he's thinking that and he's not willing to um, just realize that he was forgiven for so much and you are forgiving for so much and you guys are basically, like, there's nothing different about that. You, we're all sinners. And if he's not willing to put that off the side of his list and say, okay, then he is not the Christian man that you think he is. Mm -hmm. How would you put that, David? Yeah, I mean, I think a godly guy treats girls, and a godly girl or a godly guy is going to treat anybody like Jesus treats them, and that he doesn't treat them based on their sin or their past, yeah. but on right. their value. Like Jesus shows us how he, how a godly guy would interact with somebody who has sexual broken history. John chapter 8, a woman is caught in adultery, which is always funny because the guy was also caught in adultery. By definition, for it to be adultery, there was two of them. Yeah. But the woman was dragged out and thrown in front of Jesus and said, what law says we should stone her? What do you say we should do, Jesus? And Jesus looks at the crowd, bends over, starts writing in the ground, and then he stands up and basically says, let him who's without sin cast the first stone. Do we know what he wrote on the ground? No, I've always say. wondered that. Yeah. Lots of speculation. But then the oldest to the youngest, they end up walking off and Jesus is left with the woman and he says, where are your accusers? They're gone. Um, neither do I condemn you. Jesus says, I don't condone your sin and I don't condemn your sin. Go and sin no more. And um, and so I think a godly guy, to your point, he's forgiven much, will love much, will be able to see past those things. And if you're dating right now, you shouldn't, you shouldn't hold to a standard that God doesn't hold them to on sexual purity yeah. or perfection. Because at the same time, Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, if you lusted after a woman yeah. or, or lusted after a man, if you've committed lust, you right. have committed adultery. Right. right. So if your standard is, man, well, you know, they've slept around, unless you've never lusted after someone, you're equally as guilty according to Jesus. Yeah. yeah. So like, let's say like the soul tie stuff we were talking about. Should, is that something if you're dating somebody and they're like, hey, I I have had sex with a couple people. Is mm -hmm. that something you should be worried about? Is like, oh, well, what if these soul ties that they're they're tied to these other people? Yeah. Comes back up. I think you should actually, I think God can heal and transform and change and restore um, anybody. I mean, it's not that the effects of that sin don't have the potential to come into marriage, mm -hmm. but God can still rewrite stories and do anything mm -hmm. powerful. I mean, I remember being introduced to pornography at 12, and I can still see the images that I saw. Like, I can still see the very first image of pornography that I saw. Like, it takes a second to get in, a lifetime to get out. I mean, yeah. it's, it's sad. That's a good point. And yet, God can still give freedom and healing and restore that sexual brokenness in my life yeah. and he can do it in any of our lives. So it, it sounds like we're saying two different things, or it sounds like we're talking out of both sides of our mouths because we're mm -hmm. going like soul ties are real. And also mm -hmm. you should not care if somebody has a soul tie. And really the middle ground is more of, Hey, you shouldn't judge somebody as though they are more sinful or more broken or unworthy of a dating relationship. If today they're loving Jesus, following after him, they're pursuing healing, they're taking steps to follow Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Man, that's awesome. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that like I have a friend that um, his wife doesn't like to have sex in hotels. It's pretty graphic. Doesn't like to have sex in hotels because when they were dating, they would break away and go sleep in hotels. And it like brings back to mind things mm. with her current husband or with other people that just make her feel uncomfortable. And that's a residual effect of that sin. So it's not saying, hey, everything will always be perfect and it's just going to be easy always. At the same time, God can rewrite, restore, and work 
in the midst when we surrender that to him. Yeah. I think what's interesting too about this whole hookup culture is once again, culture is kind of, I've seen things lately that make me think culture is switching over again and kind of swing back the other direction. And I recently saw um, a podcast that a very popular like podcast about a girl. She's actually a, I mean, it's just a cultural podcast. She's, it's not Christian or anything. And she was sharing how, you know, she tests out hookup culture. She hates it. There's, she, she was saying there's so many things that are bad about it. And this is from a perspective that's not even like a Christian perspective or like a faith, not faith. It's not the reason behind it. Just based off her personal experience, she was sharing how, um, I wrote down a few things she said. Like she said, it just felt so empty. Um, she was saying sex is such an intimate thing. And it feels like when you are in this hookup culture, you barely know the person and you're acting. It's kind of like all a show. Like you're just yeah. putting on an act that you actually know this person when really you guys are strangers. And it just feels fake. It feels empty. It feels inauthentic. And she was sharing how she's such like an authentic person that it just makes her feel really awkward. It makes her feel uncomfortable. And she doesn't like it. And how it's not, you know, she's like, I sound like a grandma because um, all my friends are like out there doing it. And, you know, she's like, it's just not for me, you know. And um, not she's not. A, I don't know. I, as far as I know, no, the podcast is not about that. And um, she was just saying how the ones that she has, you know, the people that she, that's happened with, she feels so much regret over that. She felt like she gave them an intimate side of her and she wishes she could take that back. And I think that's mm. such like a common yeah. feeling um, of like, these people just took something from me and I can never get that back. They will never unsee the things they saw that day, you know, or like, I don't know. It's just a very, yeah, it's a very intimate thing to be just handing out you know to people oh, sure. um and it's just like she was also sharing it. it's like not safe like yeah you're kind of just with the stranger and you know it's not safe from like a physical perspective but also like emotionally not safe and um so even i'm saying that to say like there's even people who are not from a christian or faith perspective that are like this is bad this is toxic yeah. and i personally don't like you know they're sharing like i don't like it it's not for me and um, really, like, based off that video you were showing us earlier of yeah. the economy of sex, it's like the biggest way we can <clears throat> increase the value of sex is for um, people and even specifically women who hold a lot of that power to start increasing the value of sex, which would be like sex in the context it was designed for, which is in an intimate relationship with one person in marriage, which is the way God intended it to be. And that's how you drive up the price of of sex is by reserving it for that and keeping it sacred and keeping it intimate. Um, I just thought that was so interesting to oh. hear. And there's other, you know, I, I've heard quite a few like secular sources be like, yeah, there's not really anything there. You know, it's very empty. So how did we get to this point of like, people used to date to marry, like, I yeah. feel like when you think of grandmas, like it's like back in their day, they, this hookup culture wasn't as prevalent. Yeah. For sure as it is today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do we get to this point where it's like, if you're not on Tinder, you're not even dating. Yeah. It's like, that's not even dating. Yeah. And you, I mean, a lot of it cringes on the sexual revolution in the 1960s. <clears throat> sexual revolution had the introduction of pornography. It's when Hugh Hefner created Playboy. It's when the, the birth control pill was introduced. I mean, birth control uh, and the widespread production of um, condoms, a, a bunch of kind of these modern things that – were not a part of ancient society. And so for the first time, sex was detached from that of marriage. The prior purpose for sex was, culturally speaking, in the context of marriage and procreation. And then you decouple those things. And now you take sex outside of the consequences. Like you can, it you can, the love out of it, too. it took the love out of it because you can, there is, um, you could put a condom on to prevent getting pregnant, which doesn't always work, but there's not a condom big enough for your soul that is protective. And mm, so that's good, David. all of a sudden people decoupled <laughs> that from the context. Can I get that of, on a t-shirt? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Big enough for your soul. I like that. <laughs> and, um, but to your point, so I think that's a huge fault line in history of the sexual revolution and the introduction of pornography and then the widespread production of that. And then the sex outside of marriage and then the birth control, which allowed for the first time people to have control over that. And, um, and I think then you add the dating culture and then social media and then everything now being on your phone. It just all, it's such a fast click. Yeah. Uh, evolved. 
And today, to your point, though, there's a book that's a really, it's a secular book. It's not like a, a um, Christian book at all, but it's by Louise Perry, and it's The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, and it's a fascinating read. It's basically a woman who's not a believer, but she's saying all things that, that believers would agree with, mm-hmm. where she basically goes, hey, everything in society got really messed up, and under the name of women empowerment, we actually... Uh, communicated to women that they should use their bodies to control and manipulate people. Mm -hmm. And that introduced not just empower, but the walk of shame and the morning after pill and a bunch of things that, that have led to a lot of pain and heartbreak in people's lives. And she walks through just the case against the sexual revolution is actually brilliant and studied really, really well studied, but that's just another indication. Her conclusion at the end is women should get married young and men should get married young. They should save sex for marriage, and we should return to traditional values, which we would say is biblical values. Yeah, and she's a not a sec- believer. It's a secular book. Secular book, totally. Got you. That's wild. It's That's fascinating. Awesome. Yeah. It's a fascinating book. But I'm gonna have to read that. And I do think, like, why people do it. I, I think I'm not sure if men feel the same way, but why women would even participate in hookup culture. It's a lot of like. Just trying to fill voids, you know, like totally. feeling a void of like, I just, it makes maybe like out of empowerment. Like I want to feel like, um, I'm in charge of, yeah. you know, I don't have to wait for a man to pursue me. Cause that can be really vulnerable, you know, totally. like, oh, I'm just going to sit back and wait for a man to pursue me, you know, and just hope someone picks me, you know, whatever. Yeah. And it's like, I want to feel empowered. I want to feel confident. I want someone, I want to feel loved. I want, and it's like, Hey, all those things, maybe you will feel loved. For a little bit, you know, and then you're going to feel used, you know, yeah. and it's just like the reason why we do these things are just very short lived. The, the gratification is so quick and it's so fleeting that, yeah, to this woman's point, like, it's just, yeah. this is a better route, you know? Totally. There's actually a, I mean, this is... um I don't know if I should say this because it's kind of a, a woman who wrote as a response to that book and she wrote, and I think it was released in um, like Fox or it was released and it was, I regret being an S, uh, S word, S L U T. I don't know if that is a word to not say. And she talks about how I, just the lies of empowerment for so many years. And I regret allowing myself to, and I believed it for so many years that, man, I'm empowered and I don't need, and sex yeah. is not something that is, I need love for. And I don't even, I feel weird if a guy says that I love you. Like I'm just using my body just like any guy would. And I regret it. And I regret the fact that I devalued, my, again, she's not a believer, but yeah. again, culture is switching back over. I regret the fact that I bought the lie that under the name of empowerment, I devalued myself and gave myself to men who didn't care anything about me. That's wild. And uh, yeah. And so if that is a part of your story to summarize all of that, yeah. man, God loves you. He's not done with you. He can rewrite and take the things that locusts have eaten to use the biblical or Old Testament verse of like the days that were destroyed by those poor decisions and he can restore and rewrite your story and you're so valuable and God loves you so much. But it's heavy. It's heavy. I'm um, glad we started with Barbie. Some- <laughs> do you want to do some rapid fire questions or? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Rapid um, fire. What time you got to get out of here? I got, I got six minutes. Oh, let's go. Oh yeah, let's go. <laughs> oh, Barbie Q and A. Okay, let's go. Uh, feels like I'm stepping on my friend's coworkers in life. How can I serve? I'm just gonna read a few of them. Okay. Um, a pin. I think when I saw one that yeah, yeah, yeah. Was good. It was about um, kind of on this topic. Can I hit LDS while you do? Yeah. Mormons. So people ask about Mormons and there's a lot of similarities in terms of the language and Jesus. And you may have more friends. My best friend growing up was actually a Mormon. And um, the distinction between Mormons and Christianity, on the surface, they sound like they're not that big. Like, oh, you believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe in eternity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yet if you drill in, there's some real theological differences. One being that if you serve God faithfully, you can have the ability to go be a part of your own heaven, Mm. that you can be, that God himself was once a man, that Jesus was not eternal, that he was a created being. Things that we would say just debunk the gospel Mm. and that go against scripture. And, um, And a lot of Mormons candidly don't know those things. They just know, I believe in Jesus just like these other people. And they're so devoted and they live out their faith in such a, they're so kind that it can be compelling to say, oh, maybe they are believers, but we would say, um, like if I said uh, to use an old friend's analogy, uh, man, I just love Barney. Isn't he the best? And you won't even know this reference, but um, 
And you're like, yeah, you mean the purple dinosaur? And I was like, no, I mean, I mean the Barney from that old um, Andy Griffith show where he was like a sheriff person. We were both saying, I love Barney, I love Barney, but we mean very different Two people. Two different things. Exactly. Yeah. And that's essentially what happens with Mormonism and why we would say, mm -hmm. man, they're loved by God, and yet they don't believe what we believe in terms of Jesus being eternal, the sacrifice for those sins. God was never a man, and only through trusting Jesus God and flesh is the payment for their sin. They can have eternal life. I have, I have two questions. I just saw that are kind of good. Uh, one is, should I care about politics? I mean, in, that, in the con aspect of what? Just says, it just said, should I care about politics? Mm. I mean, politics by definition, the Latin word is like of the people. It means to care about the people or it means. So if you're saying, should I care about people? Yes. Um, but they're generally saying, Hey, should I should I actually care about political issues like the eradication of gender happening, um, the dissolution of marriage being no longer between a man and a woman, the passage of pro-abortion or anti-abortion legislation, all of which I would say as a Christian in a democracy, like that's where we have a unique privilege and mm -hmm. responsibility is we live in a, a society where we get to have a vote and we get to leverage our influence to influence others from our Christian worldview. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there is some degree to which you should mm -hmm. be um, speaking out and speaking towards, we believe that God's design leads to the best life. Mm -hmm. So we're not in a theocracy where, hey, you're going to have to follow or else you get killed or put in prison. But we're in a democracy where we can advocate for, hey, when you live in line with how God says to marry, how God says to handle money, how God says to think about life, it leads to better life. Right. And so we should advocate for policies that are consistent with that, not inconsistent with that or opposed to that. And at the same time, if somebody thinks that gender is an illusion and man and woman is not really real, mm -hmm. I can still love them, go to lunch with them, have time with them, like be a friend to them and say, I think that man and woman are really mm -hmm. different. And yeah. it's beautiful that they're different. Yeah. I remember we got into a convo about this one time. You really changed my perspective on it. I was like, actually, because we went hard about um, the whole church versus state. Oh, yeah. Wait. Yeah. Church yeah, yeah. versus state thing. And I was like, just help me understand why we can't let people do whatever they believe. If they don't believe what we believe, why are we forcing them to do what we believe? Yeah. You know? And you changed my mind when you were like, well, someone is going to get their views. Um, I forget. I don't know exactly how to put this, but someone's basically going to do that. Either we're going to do that or, or someone else is going to yeah. do totally. that. Someone's going to force their views into the law. And totally. it's a matter of who's going to do it. Because if we just sit back and say, yeah, everyone do it, then they're going to put their views push them on us, yes. you know? So unfortunately, that's just kind of the situation. And when you said that, I was like, wait, that's actually a really good point. Yes. Because us sitting back and doing nothing has a consequence. Totally. Oh, and yeah. it's like, are we? It's, which is worse? Sitting back, doing nothing, and letting everyone just follow their own beliefs or getting our views and our beliefs at least to a place mm -hmm. where we get to practice our beliefs and not really, And it happens you know, slowly. And not hurt, totally. and not even a way to hurt anyone, and a way to help everyone. Totally. Um, but anyways, I thought that was really interesting. Somebody said something recently that I thought that's such a good way of putting it. And they said, oh man, the church is going to get too political. And the reality is the opposite has happened in the last 20 years. Yeah. It's not the church has been too political. It's that politics has become theological. Mm -hmm. And that like the idea that there aren't genders, that marriage can be redefined however mm -hmm. you want, that life is defined whenever I say it is. If the baby's nine months in the womb or one week in the womb, I get to define when life is. All of those are theological ideas. So it's not that the church is too political. It's that politics has become so theological. Mm -hmm. All yeah. of those stances are being injected into culture and those right. are theological. It's like someone's beliefs are going to be law. Whose yeah. beliefs do you want it to be? Yeah. Yours or someone else's. That's really what everyone is faced with as yeah. a choice, unfortunately. So um, I wish it was more kumbaya, you know, but mm. um, do you want another question or is that it for today? What do you think? Uh, it's up to you. Okay, la we could end on last this last one. one. Let's do it. What are Christians saved from? Hell. I thought that was Sin. a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Why would a good God create no, a hell for his children? I think it's a good children? question because— Dude, we should do a whole episode on that. Okay. Let's do it. We should because there's a good answer to it. And yeah, but they're saved from hell. They're saved from the power of sin right now, the presence of sin for eternity. They're saved um, from separation from God. Um, they're saved from their sins. That was one of the first questions I think I asked you and Jason at that dinner was, uh, and uh, if we're all children of God, why would he send us to, yeah. to hell? 
Yeah, yeah. We're going to have to come back to that one. I think we know what the next episode is. All right. Let's go. All right, that's it. We'll see you. Peace.